Section 18 of And Even Now by Max Beerbohm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 18. William and Mary. 1920. Memories, like olives, are an acquired taste. William and Mary, I give them the Christian names that were indeed theirs, the joint title by which their friends always referred to them, were for some years an interest in my life, and had a hold on my affection. But a time came when, though I had known and liked them too well ever to forget them, I gave them but a few thoughts now and then. How, being dead, could they keep their place in the mind of a young man surrounded with large and constantly renewed consignments of the living? As one grows older, the charm of novelty wears off. One finds that there is no such thing as novelty, or, at any rate, that one has lost the faculty for perceiving it. One sees every newcomer not as something strange and special, but as a ticketed specimen of this or that very familiar genus. The world has ceased to be remarkable and one tends to think more and more often of the days when it was so very remarkable indeed i suppose that had i been thirty years older when i first knew him william would have seemed to me little worthier of attention than a tuppenny postage stamp seems to-day yet no william really had some oddities that would have caught even an oldster's eye in himself he was commonplace enough as I, coeval though I was with him, soon saw. But in details of surface he was unusual. In them he happened to be rather ahead of his time. He was a socialist, for example. In 1890 there was only one other socialist in Oxford, and he not at all an undergraduate, but a retired chimney-sweep named Hines, who made speeches to which nobody, except perhaps William, listened, near the martyr's memorial and william wore a flannel shirt and rode a bicycle very strange habits in those days and very horrible he was said to be though he was short-sighted and wore glasses a first-rate back at football but as football was a thing frowned on by the rowing men and coldly ignored by the bloods his talent for it did not help him he was one of the principal pariahs of our college, and it was rather in a spirit of bravado, and to show how sure of myself I was, that I began in my second year to cultivate his acquaintance. We had little in common. I could not think political economy the most exciting thing in the world, as he used to call it, nor could I, without yawning, listen to more than a few lines of Mr. William Morris's interminable, smooth, Icelandic sagas, which my friend, pious young socialist that he was, thought glorious. He had begun to write an Icelandic saga himself, and had already achieved some hundreds of verses. None of these pleased him, though to me they seemed very like his master's. I can see him now, standing on his hearth-rug, holding his manuscript close to his short-sighted eyes, declaiming the verses, and trying, with many angular gestures of his left hand, to animate them. A tall, broad, raw-boned fellow, with long brown hair flung back from his forehead, and a very shabby suit of clothes. Because of his clothes, and his socialism, and his habit of offering beer to a guest, I had at first supposed him quite poor and i was surprised when he told me that he had from his guardian his parents being dead an allowance of three hundred pounds and that when he came of age he would have an income of four hundred pounds all out of dividends he would groan i would hint that mr hines and similar zealots might disembarrass him of his load if he asked them nicely no he would say quite seriously i can't do that and would read out passages from fabian essays to show that in the present anarchical conditions only mischief could result from sporadic dispersal of rent ten twelve years hence he would muse more hopefully 
but by that time i would say you'll probably be married and your wife mightn't quite whereat he would hotly repeat what he had said many times that he would never marry marriage was an antisocial anachronism i think its survival was in some part due to the machinations of capital anyway it was doomed temporary civil contracts between men and women would be the rule ten twelve years hence pending which time the lot of any man who had civic sense must be celibacy tempered perhaps with free love long before that time was up nevertheless william married one afternoon in the spring of ninety five i happened to meet him at a corner of cockspur street i wondered at the immense cordiality of his greeting for our friendship such as it was had waned in our two final years at oxford you look very flourishing and i said you're wearing a new suit i'm married he replied obviously without a twinge of conscience he told me he had been married just a month he declared that to be married was the most splendid thing in all the world but he weakened the force of this generalization by adding that there never was any one like his wife you must see her he said and his impatience to show her proudly off to some one was so evident and so touching that i could but accept his invitation to go and stay with them for two or three days why not next week they had taken and furnished a sort of cottage in blankshire and this was their home he had run up for the day on business journalism and was now on his way to charing cross i know you'll like my wife he said at parting she's well she's glorious as this was the epithet he had erst applied to beowulf and to sigurd the volsung it raised no high hopes and indeed as i was soon to find he had again misused it there was nothing glorious about his bride some people might even have not thought her pretty i myself did not in the flash of first sight neat insignificant pleasing was what she appeared to me rather than pretty and far rather than glorious in an age of fringes her brow was severely bare she looked practical but an instant later when she smiled i saw that she was pretty too and presently i thought her delightful william had met me in a governess cart and we went to see him unharness the pony he did this in a fumbling experimental way confusing the reins with the traces and profiting so little by his wife's directions that she began to laugh and her laugh was a lovely thing quite a small sound but exquisitely clear and gay coming in a sequence of notes that neither rose nor fell that were quite even a trill of notes and then another and another as though she were pulling repeatedly a little silver bell as i describe it perhaps the sound may be imagined irritating i can only say it was enchanting i wished she would go on laughing but she ceased she darted forward and william standing obediently aside and i helping unhelpfully unharnessed the pony herself and led it into the small stable decidedly she was practical but i was prepared now to be lenient to any qualities she might have had she been feckless no doubt i should have forgiven her that too but i might have enjoyed my visit less than i did and might have been less pleased to go often again i had expected to rough it under william's roof but everything thereunder within the limits of a strict arcadian simplicity was well ordered i was touched when i went to my bedroom by the precision with which the very small maid had unpacked and disposed my things and i wondered where my hostess had got the lore she had so evidently imparted certainly not from william perhaps it only now strikes me from a handbook for mary was great at handbooks she had handbooks about gardening and others about poultry 
and one about the stable, and others on cognate themes. From these she had filled up the gaps left in her education by her father, who was a widower, and either a doctor or a solicitor, I forget which, in one of the smallest towns of an adjoining county. And I dare say she may have had, somewhere hidden away, a manual for young hostesses. If so, it must have been a good one. But to say this is to belittle Mary's powers of intuition. It was they, sharpened by her adoration of William, and by her intensity for everything around him, that made her so efficient a housewife. If she possessed a manual for young house hunters, it was assuredly not by the light of this that she had chosen the home they were installed in. The sort of cottage had been vacant for many years, an unpromising and ineligible object a mile away from a village and three miles away from a railway station. The main part of it was an actual cottage of seventeenth-century workmanship, but a little stuccoed wing had been added to each side of it, in 1850 or thereabouts, by an eccentric old gentleman who at that time chose to make it his home. He had added also the small stable, a dairy, and other appanages. For these, and for garden, there was plenty of room, as he had purchased and enclosed half an acre of the surrounding land. Those two stuccoed, very Victorian wings of his, each with a sash window above and a French window below, consorted queerly with the old red brick and latticed panes, and the long wooden veranda that he had invoked did not unify the trinity, but one didn't want it to. The wrongness had a character all its own. The wrongness was right, at any rate after Mary had hit on it for William. As a spinster she would, I think, have been happiest in a trim modern villa, but it was a belief of hers that she had married a man of strange genius. She had married him for himself, not for his genius, but this added grace in him was a thing to be reckoned with, ever so much, a thing she must coddle to the utmost in the proper setting. She was a year older than he, though being so small and slight she looked several years younger, and in her devotion the maternal instinct played a great part. William, as I have already conveyed to you, was not greatly gifted, mary's instinct in this one matter was at fault but endearingly rightly at fault and as william was outwardly odd wasn't it well that his home should be so too on the inside comfort was what mary always aimed at for him and achieved the ground floor had all been made one room into which you stepped straight from the open air quite a long, big room, or so it seemed from the lowness of the ceiling, and well freshened in its antiquity with rush mats here and there on the irregular red tiles, and very white whitewash on the plaster between the rafters. This was the dining-room, drawing-room, and general focus throughout the day, and was called simply The Room. William had a den on the ground floor of the left wing, and there in the mornings he used to write a great deal. Mary had no special place of her own. Her place was wherever her duties needed her. William wrote reviews of books for the daily blank. He did also creative work. The vein of poetry in him had worked itself out, or rather, it expressed itself for him in Mary. For technical purposes, the influence of Ibsen had superseded that of Morris. At the time of my first visit, he was writing an extraordinarily gloomy play about an extraordinarily unhappy marriage. In subsequent seasons, Ibsen's disc having been somehow eclipsed for him by George Gissing's, he was usually writing novels in which everyone, or do I exaggerate, had made a disastrous match. I think Mary's belief in his genius had made him less diffident than he was at Oxford. He was always emerging from his den with fresh pages of manuscript into the room, 
you don't mind he would say waving his pages and then would shout mary she was always promptly forthcoming sometimes from the direction of the kitchen in a white apron sometimes from the garden in a blue one she never looked at him while he read to do so would have been lacking in respect for his work it was on this that she must concentrate her whole mind privileged auditor that she was she sat looking straight before her with her lips slightly compressed and her hands folded on her lap i used to wonder that there had been that first moment when i did not think her pretty her eyes were of a very light hazel seeming all the lighter because her hair was of so dark a brown and they were beautifully set in a face of that pinched oval kind which is rather rare in england mary as listener would have atoned to me for any defects there may have been in dear old william's work nevertheless i sometimes wished this work had some comic relief in it publishers i believe shared this wish hence the eternal absence of william's name from among their announcements for mary's sake and his i should have liked him to be successful but at any rate he didn't need money he didn't need in addition to what he had what he made by his journalism and as for success well didn't mary think him a genius and wasn't he mary's husband the main reason why i wished for light passages in what he read to us was that they would have been cues for mary's laugh this was a thing always new to me i never tired of that little bell-like euphony those funny little lucid and level trills there was no stint of that charm when william was not reading to us mary was in no awe of him apart from his work and in no awe at all of me she used to laugh at us both for one thing and another just the same laugh as i had first heard when william tried to unharness the pony i cultivated in myself whatever amused her in me i drew out whatever amused her in william i never let slip any of the things that amused her in herself chaff is a great bond and i should have enjoyed our bouts of it even without mary's own special obligato she used to call me for i was very urban in those days the gentleman from london i used to call her the brave little woman whatever either of us said or did could be twisted easily into relation to these two titles and our bouts to which william listened with a puzzled benevolent smile used to cease only because mary regarded me as a possible purveyor of what william she was sure wanted and needed down there in the country alone with her intellectual conversation after his work she often i think invented duties in garden or kitchen so that he should have this stimulus or luxury without hindrance but when william was alone with me it was about her that he liked to talk and that i myself liked to talk too he was very sound on the subject of mary and so was i and if when i was alone with mary i seemed to be sounder than i was on the subject of william's wonderfulness who shall blame me had mary been a mother william's wonderfulness would have been less greatly important but he was her child as well as her lover and i think though i do not know she believed herself content that this should always be if so it were destined it was not destined so on the first night of a visit i paid them in april eighteen ninety nine william when we were alone told me news i had been vaguely conscious throughout the evening of some change conscious that mary had grown gayer and less gay somehow different somehow remote william said that her child would be born in september if all went well she's immensely happy he told me i realized that she was indeed happier than ever and of course it would be a wonderful thing for both of us he said presently to have a son or a daughter i asked him which he would rather it were a son or a daughter oh either 
he answered wearily. It was evident that he had misgivings and fears. I tried to reason him out of them. He did not, I am thankful to say, ever let Mary suspect them. She had no misgivings. But it was destined that her child should live only for an hour, and that she should die in bearing it. I had stayed again at the cottage in July for some days. At the end of that month I had gone to France, as was my custom, and a week later had written to Mary. It was William that answered this letter, telling me of Mary's death and burial. I returned to England the next day. William and I wrote to each other several times. He had not left his home. He stayed there, trying, as he said in a grotesque and heart-rending phrase, to finish a novel. I saw him in the following January. He wrote to me from Charing Cross Hotel, asking me to lunch with him there. After our first greetings there was a silence. He wanted to talk of what he could not talk of. We stared helplessly at each other, and then in the English way talked of things at large. England was engaged in the Boer War. William was the sort of man whom one would have expected to be violently pro-Boer. I was surprised at his fervor for the stronger side. He told me he had tried to enlist, but had been rejected on account of his eyesight. But there was, he said, a good chance of his being sent out, almost immediately, as one of the Daily Blank's special correspondents. And then, he exclaimed, I shall see something of it. I had a presentiment that he would not return, and a belief that he did not want to return. He did not return. Special correspondents were not so carefully shepherded in that war as they have since been. They were more at liberty to take risks on behalf of the journals to which they were accredited. William was killed a few weeks after he had landed at Cape Town. And there came, as I have said, a time when I did not think of William and Mary often, and then a time when I did more often think of them, and especially much did my mind hark back to them in the late autumn of last year, for on the way to the place I was staying at, I had passed the little railway station whose name had always linked itself for me with the names of those two friends. There were but four intervening stations. It was not a difficult pilgrimage that I made some days later, back towards the past, for that past's sake and honor. I had thought I should not remember the way, the three miles of way, from the station to the cottage, but I found myself remembering it perfectly, without a glance at the finger-posts. Rain had been falling heavily, driving the late leaves off the trees, and everything looked rather sodden and misty, though the sun was now shining. I had known this landscape only in spring, summer, early autumn. Mary had held to a theory that at other seasons I could not be acclimatized, but there were groups of trees that I knew even without their leaves, and farmhouses and small stone bridges that had not at all changed. Only what mattered was changed. Only what mattered was gone. Would what I had come to see be there still? In comparison with what it had held, it was not much but I wished to see it, melancholy spectacle though it must be for me if it were extant, and worse than melancholy if it held something new. I began to be sure it had been demolished, built over. At the corner of the lane that had led to it, I was almost minded to explore no further, to turn back. But I went on and suddenly I was at the four-barred iron gate that I remembered between the laurels. It was rusty, and was fastened with a rusty padlock, and beyond it there was grass where a winding drive had been. From the lane the cottage never had been visible, even when these laurels were lower and sparser than they were now. Was the cottage still standing? Presently I climbed over the gate, and walked through the long grass, and, yes, there was Mary's cottage, still there, 
William and Mary's cottage. Trite enough, I have no doubt, were the thoughts that possessed me as I stood gazing. There is nothing new to be thought about the evanescence of human things, but there is always much to be felt about it by one who encounters, in his maturity, some such intimate instance and reminder as confronted me in that cold sunshine across that small wilderness of long rank wet grass and weeds incredibly woe-begone and lonesome the house would have looked even to one for whom it contained no memories all the more because in its utter dereliction it looked so durable some of the stucco had fallen off the walls of the two wings thick flakes of it lay on the discoloured roof of the veranda and thick flakes of it could be seen lying in the grass below otherwise there were few signs of actual decay the sash window and the french window of each wing were shuttered and from where i was standing the cream-coloured paint of those shutters behind the glass looked almost fresh the latticed windows between had all been boarded up from within the house was not to be let perish soon i did not want to go nearer to it yet i did go nearer step by step across the wilderness right up to the edge of the veranda itself and within a yard of the front door i stood looking at that door i had never noticed it in the old days for then it had always stood open but it asserted itself now master of the threshold it was a narrow door narrow even for its height which did not exceed mine by more than two inches or so a door that even when it was freshly painted must have looked mean how much meaner now with its paint all faded and mottled cracked and blistered it had no knocker not even a slit for letters all that it had was a largish keyhole on this my eyes rested and presently i moved to it stooped down to it peered through it i had a glimpse of darkness impenetrable strange it seemed to me as i stood back that there the room was the remembered room itself separated from me by nothing but this unremembered door and a quarter of a century yes i saw it all in my mind's eye just as it had been the way the sunlight came into it through this same doorway and through the lattices of these same four windows the way the little bit of a staircase came down into it so crookedly yet so confidently and how uneven the tiled floor was and how low the rafters were and how littered the whole place was with books brought in from his den by william and how bright with flowers brought in by mary from her garden the rafters the stairs the tiles were still existing changeless in despite of cobwebs and dust and darkness all quite changeless on the other side of the door so near to me i wondered how i should feel if by some enchantment the door slowly turned on its hinges letting in light i should not enter i felt not even to look so much must i hate to see those inner things lasting when all that had given to them a meaning was gone from them taken away from them finally and yet why blame them for their survival and how know that nothing of the past ever came to them revisiting hovering something sometimes perhaps one knew so little how not to be tender to what as it seemed to me perhaps the dead loved so strong in me now was the wish to see again all those things to touch them and as it were commune with them and so queerly may the mind be wrought upon in a solitude among memories that there were moments when i almost expected that the door would obey my will i was recalled to a clearer sense of reality by something which i had not noticed before in the doorpost to the right was a small knob of rusty iron mocking reminder that to gain admission to a house one does not will the door one rings the bell unless it is rusty and has quite obviously no one to answer it in which case one goes away 
yet i did not go away the movement that i made in despite of myself was towards the knob itself but i hesitated suppose i did what i half meant to do and there were no sound that would be ghastly and surely there would be no sound and if sound there were wouldn't that be worse still my hand drew back wavered suddenly closed on the knob i heard the scrape of the wire and then from somewhere within the heart of the shut-house a tinkle it had been the weakest the puniest of noises it had been no more than is a fledgling's first attempt at a twitter but i was not judging it by its volume deafening peals from steeples had meant less to me than that one single note breaking the silence in there in there in the dark the bell that had answered me was still quivering i supposed on its wire but there was no one to answer it no footstep to come hither from those recesses making prints in the dust well i could answer it and again my hand closed on the knob unhesitatingly this time pulling further that was my answer and the rejoinder to it was more than i had thought to hear a whole quick sequence of notes faint but clear playful yet poignantly sad like a trill of laughter echoing out of the past or even merely out of this neighbouring darkness it was so like something i had known so recognizable and oh recognizing that i was lost in wonder and long must i have remained standing at that door for i heard the sound often often i must have rung again and again tenaciously vehemently in my folly end of section eighteen Section 19 of And Even Now by Max Beerbohm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 19 on Speaking French. 1919. Whenever two Englishmen are speaking French to a Frenchman, you may safely diagnose in the breast of one of the two humiliation, envy, ill will, impotent rage and a dull yearning for vengeance and you can take it that the degree of these emotions is in exact ratio to the superiority of the other man's performance in the breast of this other are contempt malicious amusement conceit vanity pity and joy in ostentation these also exactly commensurable with his advantage strange and sad that this should be so but so it is french brings out the worst in all of us all i mean but the few the lamentably far too few who cannot aspire to stammer some colloquial phrases of it even in victorian days when england was more than geographically was psychologically an island french made mischief among us and was one of the devil's favourite ways of setting brother against brother but in those days the bitterness of the weaker brother was a little sweetened with disapproval of the stronger to speak french fluently and idiomatically and with a good accent or with an idiom and accent which to other rough islanders seemed good was a rather suspect accomplishment being somehow deemed incompatible with civic worth thus the weaker ones had not to drain the last lees of their shame and the stronger could not wholly rejoice in their strength but the old saving prejudice has now died out greatly to the delight of the devil and there seems no chance that it will be revived of other languages no harm comes none of us none at any rate outside the diplomatic service has a feeling that he ought to be master of them in every recent generation a few men have learned italian because of the divina commedia 
and a very few others have tried Spanish, with a view to Cervantes, and German has pestered, not always vainly, the consciences of young men gravitating to philosophy or to science. But not for social, not for any oral purposes, were these languages essayed. If an Italian or a Spanish or a German came among us, he was expected to converse in English, or spend his time in visiting the sites silently and alone. No language except French has ever... But stay! There was, at the outbreak of the war, a great impulse toward Russian. All sorts of people wanted their children to be taught Russian without a moment's delay. I do not remember that they wanted to learn it themselves, but they felt an extreme need that their offspring should hereafter be able to converse with mujiks about icons, and the little father, and anything else, if there were anything else, that mujiks cared about. This need, however, is not felt now. When, so soon after his debut in high politics, M. Kerensky was superseded by M. Lenin, Russian was forthwith deemed a not-quite-nice language, even for children. Russia's alphabet was withdrawn from the nurseries as abruptly as it had been brought in. Le chapeau de la cousine du jardinier was re-endued with its old importance. I doubt whether Russian would, for more than a little while, have seemed to be a likely rival of French, even if M. Kerensky had been the strong man we hoped he was. The language that succeeded to Latin as the official mode of intercourse between nations, and as the usual means of talk between the well-educated people of any one land and those of any other, had an initial advantage not quite counterbalanced by the fact that there are in Russia myriads of people who speak Russian, and a few who can also read and write it. Russian may, for aught I know, be a very beautiful language. It may be as lucid and firm in its constructions as French is, and as musical in sound. I know nothing at all about it. Nor do I claim for French that it was by its own virtues predestined to the primacy that it holds in Europe. Had Italy, not France, been an united and powerful nation when Latin became desuet, that primacy would, of course, have been taken by Italian. And I cannot help wishing that this had happened. Italian, though less elegant, is, for the purpose of writing, a richer language than French, and an even subtler. And the sound of it spoken is as superior to the sound of French as a violin's is to a flute. Still, French does, by reason of its exquisite concision and clarity, fill its post of honour very worthily, and will not in any near future, I think, be thrust down. Many people, having regard to the very numerous population of the British Empire and the United States, cherish a belief that English will presently be the cock of the world's walk, but we have to consider that English is an immensely odd and irregular language, that it is accounted very difficult by even the best foreign linguists, and that even among native writers there are few who can so wield it as to make their meaning clear without prolixity, and among these few none who has not been well grounded in Latin. By its very looseness, by its way of evoking rather than defining, suggesting rather than saying, English is a magnificent vehicle for emotional poetry. But foreigners don't much want to say beautiful, haunting things to us. They want to be told what limits there are, if any, to the power of the Lord Mayor. And our rambling endeavours to explain do but bemuse and annoy them. They find that the rewards of learning English are as slight as its difficulties are great, and they warn their fellows to this effect. Nor does the oral sound of English allay the prejudice thus created. 
soothing and dear and charming that sound is to english ears but no nation can judge the sound of its own language this can be judged only from without only by ears to which it is unfamiliar and alas much as we like listening to french or italian for example italians and frenchmen if we insist on having their opinion will confess that english has for them a rather harsh sound altogether it seems to me unlikely that the world will let english supplant french for international purposes and likely that french will be ousted only when the world shall have been so internationalized that the children of every land will have to learn besides their own traditional language some kind of horrible universal lingo begotten on volapuk by a congress of the world's worst pedants almost i could wish i had been postponed to that era so much have i suffered through speaking french to frenchmen in the presence of englishmen left alone with a frenchman i can stumble along slowly indeed but still along and without acute sense of ignominy especially is this so if i am in france there is in the atmosphere something that braces one for the language i don't say i am not sorry even so for my frenchman but i am sorrier for him in england and if any englishman be included in the scene my sympathy with him is likely to be lost in my agony for myself would that i had made some such confession years ago o oh, folly of pride i liked the delusion that i spoke french well a delusion common enough among those who have never heard me somehow i seemed likely to possess that accomplishment i cannot charge myself with having ever claimed to possess it but i am afraid that when any one said to me i suppose you speak french perfectly i allowed the tone of my denial to carry with it a hint of mock modesty oh no i would say my french is wretched rather as though i meant that a member of the french academy would detect lapses from pure classicism in it or no no mine is french pour rire to imply that i was practically bilingual thus during the years when i lived in london i very often received letters from hostesses asking me to dine on the night when madame chose or monsieur tell was coming and always i excused myself not on the plea that i should be useless this method of mine would have been well enough from any but the moral standpoint had not nemesis taking her stand on that point sometimes ordained that a gall should be sprung on me it was not well with me then it was downfall and disaster strange how one will trifle with even the most imminent doom on being presented to the gall i always hastened to say that i spoke his or her language only un tout petit peu knowing well that this poor spark of slang would kindle within the breast of m tell or the bosom of madame chose hopes that must so quickly be quenched in the puddle of my incompetence i offer no excuse for so foolish a proceeding i do but say it is characteristic of all who are duffers at speaking a foreign tongue great is the pride they all take in airing some little bit of idiom i recall among many other pathetic exemplifiers of the foible an elderly and rather eminent greek who when i was introduced to him said i am jolly glad to meet you sir and having said that had nothing whatever else to say and was moreover unable to grasp the meaning of anything said by me though i said the simplest things and said them very slowly and clearly it is to my credit that in speaking english to a foreigner i do always try to be helpful 
i bear witness against madame chose and monsieur tell that for me they have never made a like effort in their french it is said that french people do not really speak faster than we and that their seeming to do so is merely because of their lighter stress on syllables if this is true i wish that for my sake they would stress their syllables a little more heavily by their omission of this kindness i am so often baffled as to their meaning to be shamed as a talker is bad enough it is even worse to be shamed in the humble refuge of listener to listen and from time to time murmur c'est vrai may seem safe enough yet there is danger even here i wish i could forget a certain luncheon in the course of which madame chose that brilliant woman leaned suddenly across the table to me and with great animation amidst a general hush launched at me a particularly swift flight of winged words with pensively narrowed eyes i uttered my formula when she ceased this formula she repeated in a tone even more pensive than mine mais je ne le connais pas she then loudly exclaimed je ne connais pas même le nom dites-moi de ce jeune homme she had as it presently turned out been asking me which of the younger french novelists was most highly thought of by english critics so that her surprise at never having heard of the gifted young sevre was natural enough we all but no i must not say that we all have painful memories of this kind some of us can understand every word that flies from the lips of madame chose or from the mouth of monsieur tell some of us can also talk quickly and well to either of these pilgrims and others can do the trick passably but the duffers are in the great grim majority and the mischief that french causes among us is mainly manifest not i would say by weaker brethren hating the strong but by weak ones hating the less weak as french is a subject on which we all feel so keenly a point of honour on which we are all so sensitive how comes it that our general achievement is so slight there was no lack of hopes of plans that we should excel in many cases time was taken for us by the forelock and a french nurse installed but alas little children are wax to receive and to retain they will be charmingly fluent speakers of french within six weeks of mariette's arrival and will have forgotten every word of it within as brief an interval after her departure later their minds become more retentive though less absorbent and then by all means let french be taught taught it is at the school where i was reared there were four french masters four but to what purpose their classrooms were scenes of eternal and incredible pandemonium filled with whoops and catcalls with devil's tattoos on desks and shrill inquiries for the exact date of the battle of waterloo nor was the lot of those four men exceptional in its horror from the accounts given to me by old boys of other schools i have gathered that it was the common lot of french masters on our shores and i have often wondered how much of the anglophobia recurrent among frenchmen in the nineteenth century was due to the tragic tales told by those of them who had returned from our seminaries to die on their own soil since nineteen fourteen doubtless french masters have had a very good time in england but even so i doubt whether they have been achieving much in the way of tutelage with the best will in the world a boy will profit but little by three or four lessons a week which are the utmost that our system allows him what he wants or at any rate will want is to be able to cope with madame chose 
a smattering of the irregular verbs will not much avail him in that emprise not in the dark byways of conjugation but on the sunny field of frank social intercourse must he prove his knighthood i would recommend that every boy on reaching the age of sixteen should be hurled across the channel into the midst of some french family and kept there for six months at the end of that time let him be returned to his school there to make up for lost time time well lost though for the boy will have become fluent in french and will ever remain so fluency is all if the boy has a good ear he will speak with a good accent but his accent is a point about which really he needn't care a jot so is his syntax not with these will he win the heart of madame chose not with these the esteem of m tell not with these anything but a more acrid rancour in the silly hostility of his competitors if a foreigner speaks english to us easily and quickly we demand no more of him we are satisfied we are delighted and any mistakes of grammar or pronunciation do but increase the charm investing with more than its intrinsic quality any good thing said making us marvel at it and exchange fatuous glances over it as we do when a little child says something sensible but heaven protect us from the foreigner who pauses searches fumbles revises comes to standstills has recourse to dumb show away with him by the first train to dover and this we may be sure is the very train m tell and madame chose would like to catch whenever they meet me or you end of section nineteen section twenty of and even now by max beerbohm this librivox recording is in the public domain section twenty laughter nineteen twenty monsieur bergson in his well-known essay on this theme says well he says many things but none of these though i have just read them do i clearly remember nor am i sure that in the act of reading i understood any of them that is the worst of these fashionable philosophers or rather the worst of me somehow i never manage to read them till they are just going out of fashion and even then i don't seem able to cope with them about twelve years ago when every one suddenly talked to me about pragmatism and william james i found myself moved by a dull but irresistible impulse to try schopenhauer of whom years before that i had heard that he was the easiest reading in the world and the most exciting and amusing i wrestled with schopenhauer for a day or so in vain time passed m bergson appeared and for his hour was lord of the ascendant i tardily tackled william james i bore in mind as i approached him the testimonials that had been lavished on him by all my friends alas i was insensible to his thrillingness his gaiety did not make me gay his crystal clarity confused me dreadfully i could make nothing of william james and now in the fullness of time i have been floored by m bergson it distresses me this failure to keep pace with the leaders of thought as they pass into oblivion it makes me wonder whether i am after all an absolute fool yet surely i am not that tell me of a man or a woman a place or an event real or fictitious surely you will find me a fairly intelligent listener any such narrative will present to me some image and will stir me to not altogether fatuous thoughts come to me in some grievous difficulty i will talk to you like a father even like a lawyer i'll be hanged if i haven't a certain mellow wisdom 
but if you are by way of weaving theories as to the nature of things in general and if you want to try those theories on someone who will luminously confirm them or powerfully rend them i must with a hangdog air warn you that i am not your man i suffer from a strong suspicion that things in general cannot be accounted for through any formula or set of formulae and that any one philosophy howsoever new is no better than another that is in itself a sort of philosophy and i suspect it accordingly but it has for me the merit of being the only one i can make head or tail of if you try to expound any other philosophic system to me you will find not merely that i can detect no flaw in it except the one great flaw just suggested but also that i haven't after a minute or two the vaguest notion of what you are driving at very well you say instead of trying to explain all things all at once i will explain some little simple single thing it was for sake of such shorn lambs as myself doubtless that m bergson sat down and wrote about laughter but i have profited by his kindness no more than if he had been treating of the cosmos i cannot tread even a limited space of air i have a gross satisfaction in the crude fact of being on hard ground again and i utter a coarse peal of laughter at least i say i do so in point of fact i have merely smiled twenty years ago ten years ago i should have laughed and have professed to you that i had merely smiled a very young man is not content to be very young nor even a young man to be young he wants to share the dignity of his elders there is no dignity in laughter there is much of it in smiles laughter is but a joyous surrender smiles give token of mature criticism it may be that in the early ages of this world there was far more laughter than is to be heard now and that eons hence laughter will be obsolete and smiles universal every one always mildly slightly smiling but it is less useful to speculate as to man's past and future than to observe men and you will have observed with me in the club-room that young men at most times look solemn whereas old men or men of middle age mostly smile and also that those young men do often laugh loud and long among themselves while we others the gayest and best of us in the most favourable circumstances seldom achieve more than our habitual act of smiling does the sound of that laughter jar on us do we liken it to the crackling thorns under a pot let us do so there is no cheerier sound but let us not assume it to be the laughter of fools because we sit quiet it is absurd to disapprove of what one envies or to wish a good thing were no more because it has passed out of our possession but it seems that i must begin every paragraph by questioning the sincerity of what i have just said has the gift of laughter been withdrawn from me i protest that i do still at the age of forty-seven laugh often and long and loud but not i believe so long and loud and often as in my less smiling youth i am proud nowadays of laughing and grateful to any one who makes me laugh that is a bad sign i no longer take laughter as a matter of course i realize even after reading m bergson on it how good a thing it is i am qualified to praise it as to what is most precious among the accessories to the world we live in different men hold different opinions there are people whom the sea depresses whom mountains exhilarate personally i want the sea always 
some not populous edge of it for choice, and with it sunshine and wine and a little music. My friend on the mountain yonder is of tougher fibre and sterner outlook, disapproves of the sea's laxity and instability, has no ear for music and no palate for the grape, and regards the sun as a rather enervating institution, like central heating in a house. What he likes is a grey day, and the wind in his face, crags at a great altitude, and a flask of whisky. Yet I think that even he, if we were trying to determine from what inner sources mankind derives the greatest pleasure in life, would agree with me that only the emotion of love takes higher rank than the emotion of laughter. Both these emotions are partly mental, partly physical. It is said that the mental symptoms of love are wholly physical in origin. They are not the less ethereal for that. The physical sensations of laughter, on the other hand, are reached by a process whose starting point is in the mind. They are not the less gloriously of our clay. There is laughter that goes so far as to lose all touch with its motive, and to exist only, grossly, in itself. This is laughter at its best. A man to whom such laughter has often been granted may happen to die in a workhouse. No matter. I will not admit that he has failed in life. Another man, who has never laughed thus, may be buried in Westminster Abbey, leaving more than a million pounds overhead. What then? I regard him as a failure. Nor does it seem to me to matter one jot how such laughter is achieved. Humour may rollick on high planes of fantasy or in depths of silliness. To many people it appeals only from those depths. If it appeal to them irresistibly, they are more enviable than those who are sensitive only to the finer kind of joke, and not so sensitive as to be mastered and dissolved by it. Laughter is a thing to be rated according to its own intensity. Many years ago I wrote an essay in which I poured scorn on the fun purveyed by music halls, and on the great public for which that fun was quite good enough. I take that callow scorn back. I fancy that the fun itself was better than it seemed to me, and might not have displeased me if it had been wafted to me in private, in presence of a few friends. A public crowd, because of a lack of broad impersonal humanity in me, rather insulates than absorbs me. Amidst the guffaws of a thousand strangers, I become unnaturally grave. If these people were the entertainment, and I the audience, I should be sympathetic enough. But to be one of them is a position that drives me spiritually aloof. Also, there is to me something rather dreary in the notion of going anywhere for the specific purpose of being amused. I prefer that laughter shall take me unawares. Only so can it master and dissolve me and in this respect, at any rate, I am not peculiar. In music halls and such places you may hear loud laughter, but not see silent laughter, not see strong men weak, helpless, suffering, gradually convalescent, dangerously relapsing. Laughter, at its greatest and best, is not there. To such laughter nothing is more propitious than an occasion that demands gravity. To have a good reason for not laughing is one of the surest aids. Laughter rejoices in bonds. If music halls were schoolrooms for us, and the comedians were our schoolmasters, how much less talent would be needed for giving us how much more joy? Even in private and accidental intercourse, few are the men whose humour can reduce us, be we never so susceptible, to paroxysms of mirth. I will wager that nine-tenths of the world's best laughter is laughter at, not laughter with, and it is the people set in authority over us that touch most surely our sense of the ridiculous. Freedom is a good thing, but we lose through it golden moments. 
the schoolmaster to his pupils the monarch to his courtiers the editor to his staff how priceless they are reverence is a good thing and part of its value is that the more we revere a man the more sharply are we struck by anything in him and there is always much that is incongruous with his greatness and herein lies one of the reasons why as we grow older we laugh less the men we esteemed so great are gathered to their fathers some of our coevals may for aught we know be very great but good heavens we can't esteem them so of extreme laughter i know not in any annals a more satisfying example than one that is to be found in moore's life of byron both byron and moore were already in high spirits when on an evening in the spring of eighteen eighteen they went from some early assembly to mr rogers house in st james place and were regaled there with an impromptu meal but not high spirits alone would have led the two young poets to such excess of laughter as made the evening so very memorable luckily they both venerated rogers strange as it may seem to us as the greatest of living poets luckily too mr rogers was ever the kind of man the coldly and quietly suave kind of man with whom you don't take liberties if you can help it with whom if you can't help it to take liberties is in itself a most exhilarating act and he had just received a presentation copy of lord thurlow's latest book poems on several occasions the two young poets found in this elder's muse much that was so execrable as to be delightful they were soon as they turned the pages held in throes of laughter laughter that was but intensified by the endeavours of their correct and nettled host to point out the genuine merits of his friend's work and then suddenly oh joy we lighted moore records on the discovery that our host in addition to his sincere approbation of some of this book's contents had also the motive of gratitude for standing by its author as one of the poems was a warm and i need not add well-deserved panegyric on himself the narrative has an added charm from tom moore's demure care not to offend or compromise the still living the still surviving rogers too far gone in nonsense for even this eulogy in which we both so heartily agreed to stop us the opening line of the poem was as well as i can recollect when rogers o'er this labour bent and lord byron undertook to read it aloud but he found it impossible to get beyond the first two words our laughter had now increased to such a pitch that nothing could restrain it two or three times he began but no sooner had the words when rogers passed his lips than our fit burst out afresh till even mr rogers himself with all his feeling of our injustice found it impossible not to join us and we were at last all three in such a state of inextinguishable laughter that had the author himself been of our party i question much whether he could have resisted the infection the final fall and dissolution of rogers rogers behaving as badly as either of them is all that was needed to give perfection to this heart-warming scene i like to think that on a certain night in spring year after year three ghosts revisit that old room and without i hope inconvenience to lord northcliffe who may happen to be there sit rocking and writhing in the grip of that old shared rapture uncanny well not more so than would have seemed to byron and moore and rogers the notion that more than a hundred years away from them was some one joining in their laughter as i do alas i cannot join in it more than gently to imagine a scene however vividly does not give us the sense of being or even of having been present at it 
indeed the greater the glow of the scene reflected the sharper is the pang of our realization that we were not there and of our annoyance that we weren't such a pang comes to me with special force whenever my fancy posts itself outside the temple's gate in fleet street and there at a late hour of the night of may tenth seventeen seventy three observes a gigantic old man laughing wildly but having no one with him to share and aggrandize his emotion not that he is alone but the young man beside him laughs only in politeness and is inwardly puzzled even shocked boswell has a keen an exquisitely keen scent for comedy for the fun that is latent in fine shades of character but imaginative burlesque anything that borders on lovely nonsense he was not formed to savour all the more does one revel in his account of what led up to the moment when johnson to support himself laid hold of one of the posts at the side of the foot pavement and sent forth peals so loud that in the silence of the night his voice seemed to resound from temple bar to fleet ditch no evening ever had an unlikelier ending the omens were all for gloom johnson had gone to dine at general paoli's but was so ill that he had to leave before the meal was over later he managed to go to mr chambers's rooms in the temple he continued to be very ill there but gradually felt better and talked with a noble enthusiasm of keeping up the representation of respectable families and was great on the dignity and propriety of male succession among his listeners as it happened was a gentleman for whom mr chambers had that day drawn up a will devising his estate to his three sisters the news of this might have been expected to make johnson violent in wrath but no for some reason he grew violent only in laughter and insisted thenceforth on calling that gentleman the testator and chafing him without mercy i dare say he thinks he has done a mighty thing he won't stay till he gets home to his seat in the country to produce this wonderful deed he'll call up the landlord of the first inn on the road and after a suitable preface upon mortality and the uncertainty of life will tell him that he should not delay in making his will and here sir will he say is my will which i have just made with the assistance of one of the ablest lawyers in the kingdom and he will read it to him he believes he has made this will but he did not make it you chambers made it for him i hope you have had more conscience than to make him say being of sound understanding ha 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 i hope he has left me a legacy i'd have his will turned into verse like a ballad these flights annoyed mr chambers and are recorded by boswell with the apology that he wishes his readers to be acquainted with the slightest occasional characteristics of so eminent a man certainly there is nothing ridiculous in the fact of a man making a will but this is the measure of johnson's achievement he had created gloriously much out of nothing at all there he sat old and ailing and unencouraged by the company but soaring higher and higher into absurdity more and more rejoicing and still soaring and rejoicing after he had gone out into the night with boswell till at last in fleet street his paroxysms were too much for him and he could no more echoes of that huge laughter come ringing down the ages but is there also perhaps a note of sadness for us in them johnson's endless sociability came of his inherent melancholy he could not bear to be alone and his very mirth was but a mode of escape from the dark thoughts within him of these the thought of death was the most dreadful to him and the most insistent he was for ever wondering how death would come to him 
and how he would acquit himself in the extreme moment. A later, but not less devoted Anglican, meditating on his own end, wrote in his diary that to die in church appears to be a great euthanasia, but not, he quaintly and touchingly added, at a time to disturb worshippers. Both the sentiment here expressed and the reservation drawn would have been as characteristic of Johnson as they were of Gladstone. But to die of laughter, this too seems to me a great euthanasia, and I think that for Johnson to have died thus that night in Fleet Street would have been a grand ending to a life radically wretched. Well, he was destined to outlive another decade, and, selfishly, who can wish such a life as his, or such as Boswell's, one jot shorter? Strange, when you come to think of it, that of all the countless folk who have lived before our time on this planet, not one is known in history or in legend as having died of laughter. Strange, too, that not to one of all those characters in romance has such an end been allotted. Has it ever struck you what a chance Shakespeare missed when he was finishing the second part of King Henry the Fourth? Falstaff was not the man to stand cowed and bowed while the new young king lectured him and cast him off. Little by little, as Hal proceeded in that portentous allocution, the humour of the situation would have mastered old Sir John. His face, blank with surprise at first, would presently have glowed and widened, and his whole bulk have begun to quiver. Lest he should miss one word, he would have mastered himself, but the final words would have been the signal for release of all the roars pent up in him. The welkin would have rung. The roars, belike, would have gradually subsided in dreadful rumblings of more than utterable or conquerable mirth. Thus, and thus only, might his life have been rounded off with dramatic fitness. Secundum ipsius naturam. He never should have been left to babble of green fields, and die, and it had been any Christum child. Falstaff is a triumph of comedic creation, because we are kept laughing equally at and with him. Nevertheless, if I had the choice of sitting with him at the boar's head, or with Johnson at the Turks, I shouldn't hesitate for an instant. The agility of Falstaff's mind gains much of its effect by contrast with the massiveness of his body. But in contrast with Johnson's equal agility is Johnson's moral as well as physical bulk. His sallies tell, the more startlingly, because of the noble weight of character behind them. They are the better because he makes them. In Falstaff there isn't this final incongruity and element of surprise. Falstaff is but a sublimated sample of the funny man. We cannot therefore laugh so greatly with him as with Johnson, nor even at him, because we are not tickled so much by the weak points of a character whose points are all weak ones, also because we have no reverence trying to impose restraint upon us. Still, Falstaff has indubitably the power to convulse us. I don't mean we ever are convulsed in reading Henry the Fourth. No printed page, alas, can thrill us to extremities of laughter. These are ours, only if the mirth-maker be a living man, whose jests we hear as they come fresh from his own lips. All I claim for Falstaff is that he would be able to convulse us if he were alive and accessible. Few, as I have said, are the humorists who can induce this state. To master and dissolve us, to give us the joy of being worn down and tired out with laughter, is a success to be won by no man, save in virtue of a rare staying power. Laughter becomes extreme only if it be consecutive. There must be no pauses for recovery. Touch-and-go humor, however happy, is not enough. The jester must be able to grapple his theme and hang on to it, 
twisting it this way and that, and making it yield magically all manner of strange and precious things, one after another, without pause. He must have invention, keeping pace with utterance. He must be inexhaustible. Only so can he exhaust us. I have a friend whom I would praise. There are many other of my friends to whom I am indebted for much laughter, but I do believe that if all of them sent in their bills to-morrow, and all of them overcharged me not a little, the total of all those totals would be less appalling than that which looms, in my own vague estimate, of what I owe to Comus. Comus, I call him here, in observance of the line drawn between public and private virtue, and in full knowledge that he would, of all men, be the least glad to be quite personally thanked and laurelled in the marketplace for the hours he has made memorable among his cronies. No one is so diffident as he, no one so self-postponing. Many people have met him again and again, without faintly suspecting anything much in him. Many of his acquaintance, friends too, relatives even, have lived and died in the belief that he was quite ordinary. Thus is he the more greatly valued by his cronies. Thus do we pride ourselves on possessing some curious right quality to which alone he is responsive. But it would seem that either this asset of ours, or its effect on him, is intermittent. He can be dull and null enough with us, sometimes, a mere asker of questions, or drawer of comparisons between this and that brand of cigarettes, or full expatiator on the merits of some new patent razor. A whole hour and more may be wasted in such humdrums and darkness. And then something will have happened. There has come a spark in the murk. A flame now, presage of a radiance. Comus has begun. His face is a great part of his equipment. A cast of it might be somewhat akin to the comic mask of the ancients, but no cast could be worthy of it. Mobility is the essence of it. It flickers and shifts in accord to the matter of his discourse. It contracts and it expands. Is there anything its elastic can't express? Comus would be eloquent even if he were dumb, and he is mellifluous. His voice, while he develops an idea or conjures up a scene, takes on a peculiar richness and unction. If he be describing an actual scene, voice and face are adaptable to those of the actual persons therein. But it is not in such mimicry that he excels. As a reporter, he has rivals. For the most part, he moves on a higher plane than of mere fact. He imagines, he creates, giving you not a person but a type, a synthesis, and not what anywhere has been, but what anywhere might be, what, as one feels for all the absurdity of it, just would be. He knows his world well, and nothing human is alien to him. But certain skeins of life have a special hold on him, and he on them. In his youth he wished to be a clergyman, and over the clergy of all grades and denominations his genius hovers and swoops and ranges with a special mastery. Lawyers he loves less, yet the legal mind seems to lie almost as wide open to him as the sacerdotal and the legal manner, in all its phases, he can unerringly burlesque. In the minds of journalists, diverse journalists, he is not less thoroughly at home, so that, of the wild contingencies imagined by him, there is none about which he cannot reel off an oral leader or middle in the likeliest style, and with as much ease as he can preach a high church or low church sermon on it nor are his improvisations limited by prose. If a theme call for nobler treatment, he becomes an unflagging fountain of ludicrously adequate blank verse. 
or again he may deliver himself in rhyme there is no form of utterance that comes amiss to him for interpreting the human comedy or for broadening the farce into which that comedy is turned by him nothing can stop him when once he is in the vein no appeals move him he goes from strength to strength while his audience is more and more piteously debilitated what a gift to have been endowed with what a power to wield and how often i have envied comus but this envy of him has never taken root in me his mind laughs doubtless at his own conceptions but not his body and if you tell him something that you have been sure will convulse him you are likely to be rewarded with no more than a smile betokening that he sees the point incomparable laughter giver he is not much of a laugher he is vintner not toper i would therefore not change places with him i am well content to have been his beneficiary during thirty years and to be so for as many more as may be given us end of section twenty recorded by kirsten weber end of and even now by max beerbohm